I've got just a few minutes to go through. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about high populations, high corn yields. The last several years, we've been looking at, um, at pushing populations pretty high, some populations of 50, 60,000 plants per acre. Uh, we started out doing those studies because we were curious about where the corn crop fell apart on us. At what level would things fall short, and then how do we, how do we fix that? What we found was just the opposite, that actually things are looking pretty decent, we're holding up fairly well, and so then the, the, the research kind of switched into, well, what can we do to try to maximize those yields? Where, do we, where is our upper limit, really, when we talk about corn production? Um, and so to get into that, I'll talk about water use. That's a relevant topic for this particular season. Right now, the majority of our crop around the state is somewhere after tassel silk and at some point in seed fill. Most of it isn't to black layer yet. Most, some of it's in the dent, but a lot of it isn't. And for the stuff that's from tassel to about the dough stage, that corn requires on average one inch of water every three days. One inch of water every three days in there. Our entire corn crop for a season typically takes about 20 to 25 inches to make it go all the way through. Most years, our biggest limitation to corn yield, for all the management we do and everything else, our biggest limitation is lack of water sometime in July. Everybody in the room knows if you're gonna make a good corn crop, you gotta have good moisture in July. This July may be just a little bit ridiculous, <laughs> all right? But you gotta have good moisture in there, so, all right. All right, and then just to further highlight this point, for those of you in the back, we did a study several years ago. We did populations from 20,000 up to 45,000, 30 inch rows. Four different hybrids. The goal of the project was to look at something entirely different. What we found out the first year, which was 2008, we had a drought. We, our highest yield was 123 bushels per acre at our lowest population. Every population we went up higher after that, the yields got less and less. We turned this data into the company at the end of the year, and they said, are you sure about this? You know, this is not at all what we thought we were going to see from this. This is not how you sell seed corn. All right, so the end of the story was the best thing we should have done that particular year for that particular field was grow soybeans, not do a corn crop. So lack of water really hurt our yields. The very next year, same rotation, same soil type, same management, same fertility, all of those things, a different year, very timely rainfall. We got good showers on a timely fashion. Same four hybrids, same genetics. You can see our lowest yield the second year was 175, 50 bushels better than our best yield the year before. And our best yield was the highest population, 315 bushels. So we got 300, and that's averaged over four hybrids, folks, 315 bushels off of that. So, part of our job is to recommend different things like seeding rates. Same four hybrids, same soil type, same management, two different years. What population do we recommend? Got one for 28, someone said depends, we can't get away with that answer, unless we're an economist. So, what else? All right, so you see the challenges we deal with. It, I'm, I put this up here to give you this, everything, we can do everything right in a field and we don't have water at the right time, we've got 90 bushel corn. We can make a few mistakes in some other years and get some really good yields. If we don't make the mistakes, we have some excellent, phenomenal yields. Uh, all right, let's get to some of these other studies. So what we did from that season on, we kept pushing populations a little bit higher, a little bit higher. What I've got here is a set of corn studies where we did it in 15 inch rows. We did it in 15 inch rows so we could handle 50 and 60,000 plants per acre, okay? I know some of the seed corn companies will test higher populations in 30 inch rows, but for what we were doing, we had to go to narrow rows. And why do we choose 15 and not 20? Everybody asks that question. Well, we say, well, a lot of farmers in the state already have 15 inch row planters because of double crop beans, so that'd be a logical switch. You're not changing out equipment. But the other reason is it's easy for us to still harvest with a 30 inch head on the combine. It's not something they want to do in a 100 acre field, but for test plots, we can make it work, okay? And we've got a planter that will do 15s, 20s, and 30s, do the variable rate populations that you see. We can do variable rate fertilizer, or, or excuse me, variable, we can vary our hybrids, and now 
we can also do in furrow seed treatments on it as well. And so we've got some inoculant studies uh, in, in soybeans. I'm getting off the topic. This is uh, uh, three different locations over, or three different site years. You can see our, our lowest population was 20,000. The highest was about 60. Uh, these, are, um, these are our final stands that we're looking at in here. And our yields went from 261 to 289, 288, 276. Average somewhere in there. I've got one other location that was a bit of an outlier. That means that the yields were a little bit different. This location, this was Boone County in 2015. You can see in that particular location, our highest population, 60,000, gave us our highest yield, 354. Why am I showing you this? I just want to show you that we got 350 bushel corn. <laughs> All right. We'll talk a little bit about it as to, as to how we got there, but I wanted to show you that we, we did get some phenomenal yields. We had another study up there again this year. Uh, three weeks ago, my students were checking the field, walking it, taking measurements, doing some, some NDVI measurements and things like that. Said it's a beautiful field, things are great. The next morning, the farmer called and said, Chad, we had some wind overnight and there's some green snap in your plots. You may want to come check it out. And so we went back up a week later, hoping that it was just root lodging and the corn was growing back up. And uh, about 50% of our plants were wiped out from, from green snap. So, at any rate. Okay, one thing that happens when we go to higher populations. So what I've got now, both of these graphs on the bottom are, are plants per acre. The population is going up to higher and higher populations. And we're looking at two different seed number up here. On the left with the red, you can see kernels per ear. So as our population gets higher and higher, the number of kernels on an ear gets lower and lower. Every seed guy loves to show you a big, beautiful ear. Decalb has it on their logo, right? That big, beautiful ear. There's a problem with that decalb hybrid ear. It's probably at a too low of a population. Okay? All right, that picture, it's a beautiful picture. All right, so our, our, our population, our kernels per ear range from about um, 750 on the high side to down about 500. And so as population gets higher and higher, we get fewer and fewer kernels per ear, typically. The flip side of that, though, is if you look at the total number of kernels per acre, we still had more kernels per acre as population went up. So the first graph I showed you where we had the four different seeding rates, we had basically our highest yields were right there between 40 and 50,000, right? This is the same numbers coming off of here that went into that data. If our yields kept going, if our yields kind of went up and plateaued off a little bit, but our total kernel number per acre keeps going up, what's the difference in here? Why didn't yields go up consistently with it? My students can't answer. What else? Kernel size. There you go. Right on, first in line for lunch. Okay, kernel size. And so this is. This is flip, folks. This is number of kernels in a bushel. All right? So the higher the number, the smaller the kernel size. Okay? I, I put it this way because most of you in the room don't think in milligrams per kernel. You think in number of kernels in a bushel. And so at our low population, we're about 80,000 kernels in a bushel. That's a decent seed size. Most folks would take that. As our populations got higher and higher, we dropped down to about 100,000 kernels per acre. This is all I should back up. It's all irrigated corn. I mentioned some 15 inch rows. Uh, we're, we're doing nitrogen applications at three to four different timings in the season, so we're trying to be very efficient at the nitrogen fertilizer. There's a nitrogen rate component to this study. I've not really talked about that at this point. Um, so I wanted to tell you, we, we did a good job on management, but what we found is, and we're, we're trying to figure this out, is we're, what we'd like to do is as we push population up, we'd like to increase the number of kernels per ear and or increase that kernel mass. If you're talking about those ridiculous yields that you hear about in some other places, you've got to have that. If you're gonna get 530 bushel corn, if you're gonna get 530 bushel corn, you've gotta have at least 50,000 plants per acre and you've gotta, I'm gonna back this up for a second, you've gotta have at least 800 kernels on an ear at 80,000 kernels per bushel. I'll repeat that one more time. If you're gonna get 530 some bushel corn, you gotta have 50,000 ears per acre, they gotta be at least 800 kernels per ear, and they gotta be of a seed size of at least 80,000 seeds per bushel. 
four larger. Okay? Those are phenomenal numbers. Those are phenomenal numbers that we deal with. All right. One of the things, you go to a higher population, what we're concerned about, as population gets higher and higher, it does add stress to the system. We saw that when I showed you the drought year data, right? The high population added stress, we had low water, boom, yields were taken out. Seed companies, when they want to test for stress, they test for a high population. It serves two purposes. The high population stresses the plant, the ones that survive, in theory, tolerate more stress in general, and therefore are going to be better hybrids. At the same time they're doing that, what are they also doing? They're selecting hybrids that handle higher populations. And what do they sell you? Geyser. One more time, folks. What do they sell you? What's a seed company? Seed. Somebody. Thank you. Okay. So it serves two purposes in that process. So one of the questions we asked is, as our populations go up higher and higher, does it induce greater nitrogen deficiency symptoms? We asked a different question, do we need more nitrogen to handle higher populations in this? You're looking at this graph here, you think about nitrogen, it moves from the bottom of the plant upwards, and what we're measuring here is we said the ear leaf is zero, and everything below that, we counted ears below. We were counting how many leaves up, or how many leaves below the ear leaf, did we see nitrogen deficiency show up? And if you look at this data here, what it tells you is, as populations got higher, nitrogen deficiency moved up a little bit into the plant. Now these were taken at about R5, so you're in that dense stage pretty far into it. And taken at R5 like that, what that's telling us is even though we had some nitrogen deficiency moving up the plant a little bit, which was confounded with senescence, 60,000 plants per acre is a lot of corn plants. It shades a lot. Okay, we joked that the first year we did that, the shade came out and grabbed us. It was dark underneath there. So you got some of that going on. The deficiencies we were showing up here were not yield limiting. They should not have been yield limiting based on where they were on the stock at that point. Several things in this, the, the, the biggest thing here is what we also saw from this is that the higher populations, it stretches out the time between tassel emergence and silk emergence. It didn't stretch it out enough to cause pollination issues for us, but it does show us it's another symptom of some stress. And so even in this environment with a lot of irrigation, hopefully timely with, it, with three or four applications of nitrogen at different times, uh, with other fungicides, other things we did to manage this plot, we still have stress coming in from these higher populations. Something we've got to figure out some more. All right, let me, um, I'll, I'll do this. We did put some partial economics to it. Does it pay? The, the long story short is if you look at all the economics for what we did with different nitrogen rates and seeding rates right now under an irrigated situation for the sites that we tested, your ideal uh, seeding rate was somewhere around 40 to 45,000 seeds per acre economically, and your ideal nitrogen rate was about 225, somewhere in that ballpark. I will say what was surprising to us is so we tested nitrogen rates up to 325 pounds per acre on most of these studies, and what, we've, what really surprised is what we thought would happen is we would need more nitrogen for these really high populations. But what we found was that at each location, the ideal nitrogen rate was the ideal rate regardless of population. Okay, that, that's important, because we got a lot of folks right now doing variable rate seeding and variable rate nitrogen. And it's only a few locations, it's a little bit of, of data at this point, but this data would tell us at this point that we don't necessarily need to do both of those scenarios. We may need to adjust populations based on some soil types and things like that, but at least from this little bit that we've got tested here, increasing or decreasing nitrogen with our population may not be helping us out. All right, and I'll put up the other one. So the other one, we had, a, we had an oops on our nitrogen application, and the oops was the farmer told us up front they're gonna put this amount on, at least that's what we understood. We came back later and he put on a whole lot more. So we had a whole lot higher nitrogen rate. So to get the high yield, we had to have a lot higher nitrogen rate, but if you put the economics to it, the most economical rate was the lowest one we applied to 325. So while that 354 bushels is fun to show you, we didn't make very much money getting there in the process, okay? So maybe the other slight takeaway from this is if you're gonna, one, if you're gonna push for high yields, I hope somebody does, because I have fun working on it, and uh, it, it's fun to, to play with, but, Pushing for those really, really high yields 
regardless of what they say in the shiny magazines, pushing for the really, really high yields may not make you the most money right now. You still got to look at that bottom line. And that bottom line would tell us that even in that particular scenario, our best population, while our highest yield was at, at the higher end rate, or excuse me, was at the highest population, our most economical population is still around 40,000 in that scenario. Okay, I think I'm about done for my time. So I'll be happy to entertain a question or two, if that's all right with uh, Director Grove. Okay. Yes, sir. Your uh, recommendations about 40,000 on irrigated, we'd say 40 to 45, somewhere in there on an irrigated. On a non-irrigated, it depends a little bit on your soil depth. And so if you, uh, if you farm up in Rankin's neck of the woods in Union County, you can probably be up around 35 to, to uh, 38,000. If you're into uh, uh, more of the Crider type soils and things like that, probably about 28 to uh, 33, 34. And then if you're on some eroded slopes, which I'm sure Nobody in the room has, but your neighbors do, yeah. right? If you got those eroded slopes, there's probably no sense being above about 24,000 on the eroded slopes. And that's just because this might be the only year where the eroded slope is going to yield really, really well. <laughs> okay? But most years it's not. And so most years water limitation is going to be an issue for you. So good question. Other? Yes, sir. Good question. So we got so we got smaller seed size at the high population. Did it change our quality at all as well? Uh, the students are testing nutrients, so N, P, and K, and we found even at the highest nitrogen rates, we found that smaller seed size, our nitrogen concentration is also going down at those higher populations. And so part of the we, that's that's all we looked at. We didn't look at at total digestible nutrients. We didn't look at other things like that. So, but that's a, that's a question we're trying to figure out is we put extra nitrogen out, we put it out late, some of it we did after tassel to try to help with that with the idea that we could get more into the kernels that way, and it didn't show up in our studies with what we've done so far. It's a good question. Yes, sir. So what? This is irrigated. This is irrigated. We'd say, so I would say right now in AGR1, our recommendation for irrigated corn is 200. Is that where it's at, John? And our data, a little bit of data we've got to maybe add to that discussion would suggest we ought to be closer to 225 if we're managing everything else right in an irrigated field. For in a non-irrigated field, we probably should be less than that. All right. I think based on that, let's take a break. Is that, yep. is that okay? It's, uh, break time.